Hello, everybody. I'm Tom Connolly, founder, chief investment officer of Versa Capital Management, a family office and wealth management firm based in Phoenix and with uh, a presence soon to be opened in Dallas, Texas. Thank you all for joining me today. Today, I'm going to talk about the idea of China and is it investable? Now, over time, the, the question has been generated from a number of different directions. Back in 2021, or around that time, most of the concerns were around changes in governance and policy within um, China itself, within the government. Later, more toward today, concerns are more about economic fundamentals, number one, and number two, more specifically, uh, the property sector within China. So today we'll spend a few minutes just talking about all those things and getting some background. In summary, to let you know where we're going to end up uh, here at Versant, we do believe China is investable uh, for a variety of reasons, but it is basically on watch here. We are watching it very carefully and have been doing so uh, for the last four or five years based on some of these concerns. So a little background. China represents about 18% of the world's population and world gross domestic product or, or uh, relative size of the economy to the world economy. Very, very sizable. Uh, comparable to the U.S. in both of the, uh, well, much more population than the U.S., but the GDP is very similar. However, China is only about 3% of global stock market value. So one of the things that's interesting about China uh, as an emerging, still categorized as an emerging market country, is that we have, asked, we have a chance for not only uh, capital uh, deepening, which is the application of technology, and technological growth on a per capita basis in the population, but capital widening where the standard of living um, gets uh, expands to more of a populate more of a latent population whereas in the US uh, most of the population has a fairly high standard of living some more than others but in the aggregate everybody's pretty close everyone's got refrigerators cell phones TVs etc not the case there uh, in the that's one of the attractions of, of emerging markets so in the emerging market, part of the world stock portfolio, EM is about 10% versus uh, about a little over 60 for the US. And of that 10% in the emerging markets, China is 30. So it's a very big slice of the EM sector. So it's certainly not something to be ignored uh, relative to its size and, and the economic uh, potential looking forward. Um, so what started some of the concerns was uh, we, we all know China has a different economic and, and uh, governance model than we do. Uh, and in 1921, um, Xi introduced, reintroduced actually this idea of common prosperity, which actually comes from the Mao days back in the 50s. Um, the thrust here uh, was to focus on property, health care, and education. They are concerned, uh, the Chinese uh, government was concerned about uh, inequality in all of these different areas. So in 1921, what was in the news anyway, was a, began with a crackdown on private education, which is about a $120 billion industry in China. They converted all the for-profit firms um, into nonprofits and stopped issuing licenses. Then there was a, uh, if you probably remember, uh, more regulation of the digital platform companies. You probably remember Jack Ma, the CEO of Alibaba, just kind of disappeared for a couple of years and has come back very quiet and chastened. Um, uh, they, uh, the government nixed an, an IPO from out of Alibaba, a company called Ant. Uh, and so uh, we have increasing regulatory and government interference on corporate 
in corporate affairs. So the, the idea here within the Chinese government was to place more emphasis on stakeholders than shareholders. Does that sound familiar? Uh, that's the case here too in some a lot of the rhetoric in the present administration. So to, in order to do that, they would check the power of corporations, uh, try to rebalance the economy in favor of labor. Uh, uh, again, does that that must sound familiar um, uh, because there's some of the same rhetoric coming out of the U.S. today. However, um, this does not mean a return necessarily to the old days of Maoism. Uh, or Soviet-style uh, Marxism. Um, the Chinese government wants kind of a hybrid situation where they have markets that are somewhat free, um, but where the government shepherds them, shepherds economic activity into channels that it deems uh, preferable rather than a more freewheeling style that we have in the West here where things are done legislatively, China is going to do it top down. Now, if that doesn't sound a whole lot different to you than the Soviet era or the uh, Mao, uh, Maoist times, um, that uh, is a debatable point. Uh, reasonable people can disagree, but we don't see the uh, social, economic, and governmental power being concentrated and, and levied to the effect we, we do uh, we did back in those periods. So this is one area, frankly, above and beyond all the others that we are focused on here at Verson. Um, will the government and the powers that be in China allow investors, shareholders, bondholders, to realize uh, the profits they they expect or are entitled to as, as owners of capital? Um, that is the question we are we are watching most closely here. So the answer at this point in time is a qualified yes. Recently, China has begun to back off of some of the regulatory uh, and, and uh, government edicts that have, they have levied uh, in the past. Um, they're backing off of that. Jack Ma has come back out into the into the into the public. Um, and so we think they realize they have gone too far in trying to control the economy, but we'll, we're going to keep a very close eye on that. Uh, the other thing is, um, is China in a bubble? Um, and it depends uh, from what angle of the crystal you're viewing uh, into the crystal. You could say, uh, and, and comparisons have been made with uh, China vis-a-vis -vis Japan. And I can tell you that China is nowhere near what the Japan bubble was, having lived through the Japan bubble. Um, back in the, during the Japan bubble, uh, there was a monstrous property and stock market bubble. The, the earnings, uh, price earnings ratio, what you pay for a dollar of corporate earnings, excuse me, in Japan was uh, over a hundred times. Just to give you a frame of reference, our highest price earnings ratio during the tech bubble in the US was about 45. <clears throat> in China right now, it's like 12 and a half. And if you look not at the last 12 months earnings, but what analysts project forward is the next 12 months earnings, it's under 10, it's like 9.7. And the US is approximately twice ours, um, or twice China's, excuse me. And so, uh, uh, the market in China, stock market anyway, is very, very far from bubble pricing. In fact, many people would argue that it's the opposite, that it's actually an investment opportunity relative to developed market and other emerging market countries. If you drill down a little bit, um, you could say, well, the third point I made about the property market, the property market is about 30% of the Chinese economy, and it is under extreme duress. It is also priced for extreme duress. Um, the economy, uh, the, the real estate sector is huge. That is one of the things that China did uh, to generate the very high rate of GDP or economic growth over the last 30 years or so, was focus on infrastructure and its residential um, 
uh, and uh, uh, commercial real estate sectors to the point where they overbuilt them by quite a, quite a bit. And now that is coming back to roost. In other words, there's economic growth that's probably a lot of it's phantom. Um, a lot of money was spent, a lot of building was done, houses that people will never live in. Um, it was wasted capital. Um, so that's going to have to be worked out. It, there's a lot of debt involved in that sector, but we, the Chinese have more than enough financial resources to work through this problem through uh, restructuring um, on both the property owners and the debtors point of view. The Chinese have $3.2 trillion of foreign currency reserves. They have a, a tremendous, more than enough resources to work through this problem. So although it will cause some duress um, and slow economic growth uh, to a large degree, at least to some degree, it's priced into existing markets. So we don't think that in and of itself is a reason to avoid uh, the Chinese market. We don't think China is going to implode. There are too many resources uh, there. So China, investing in China is important. There are certainly um, uh, obstacles that one can see and discuss. We have them here in the U.S right front and center with an election coming up. Europe has them. Everybody's got problems and issues to work through. Um, and uh, I, I'm not holding the Chinese model out as a, uh, as a preferred model of development. In fact, I do not think it is. Um, but I still, I think that that market has a lot of potential growth. As long as it allows shareholders to participate in it, it is uh, one that offers us a lot of opportunity. Um, the last thing I'd want to say is, uh, in, in terms of innovation uh, and R and D, and pat, you know, China leads the world in filing for patents. Um, if you look at the in, uh, innovative companies, um, the top 100, and you look at the top 100 R and D investors in 2022, uh, the U.S. leads. About half of those companies are in the U.S. Well, that makes sense because the U.S. is about half the world stock market. Uh, the next, the company that's next in line, before Germany, is China. Um, so, if you if you look at uh, the the R and D, um, if if in fact if you look at the total R and D in the Asia Pacific sector, which include China is is a majority of that, um, it exceeds that of North America. Um, so together with uh, investment in research and development, the fact that they are graduating more engineers from China, uh, certainly more than in the U.S., um, they are the uh, leading uh, generator of technical expertise in the world. Um, the fact that they lead in patents, R&D, and are among the leaders in R&D gives us uh, good um, uh, feelings about where things are going in the future as far as generating wealth. So I hope I've alleviated some of the concerns about China um, is with respect to what, how investing should be looked at and then uh, let you know also that we are not completely sold and are keeping our eye on developments. How uh, you as uh, shareholders in Chinese investments uh, through our portfolio management um, are uh, going to be treated in the future. So thank you so much for spending some time with me today. Uh, I hope you tune in to future videos um, and have a great weekend. Thank you.